I have recently had a kind of funny interaction with some of my friends. We'll be hanging out at a party, whatever, and they'll ask, what are you reading, Jamel? And I say, well, I've read this fantastic biography of a young Hubert Humphrey. And most of my friends know like a bit about American political history, Not some, but some of them are actually historians. And so my friends who are kind of like, yeah, I know who Hubert Humphrey are, is, will say, oh, that's interesting. And my friends who are historians will say, what are you doing reading about Hubert Humphrey? Um, which is to say the reaction from my circle of, of friends ranges from like curiosity to a kind of disgust. And the disgust makes sense, really. Humphrey occupies an unusual position in our collective memory. Um, he is mostly remembered for his support of the Vietnam War and his defeat at the hands of Richard Nixon in the 68 election. And because of that, for most people, for most people who think about politics at all, he's kind of a footnote to this larger story of Vietnam and Nixon. And to people who are in the know, as it were, he is a real object of contempt, someone who represents kind of the wrong side of politics in the late 60s. But the Humphrey of the 1960s is uh, not the only Humphrey. The, the guy who represented this old and failing liberal establishment um, is not the only version of the guy who existed. There was a time, in fact, when Hubert Humphrey was a young man himself, when he was pressing against the limits of the possible, when he was eager to make trouble for justice and equality. And Samuel G. Friedman's Into the Bright Sunshine is the story of that Hubert Humphrey. It's the story of a young man raised in the isolated, or sorry, of how a young man raised in the isolated lily white prairie of South Dakota uh, becomes a crusader for civil rights. It's the story of how a young man of great ability and even greater ambition harnessed his deeply felt sense of justice and deployed it to fight for a better world. And it's the story of how this remarkable young man made politics his vocation, his chosen field for pursuing his ideals. We live in a moment of, I think, real cynicism about politics, about the ability of politics to actually change our world um, and to say nothing of the ability of our political system to change our world. That cynicism about politics, I think, has brought apathy and disenchantment. It has fueled some of the authoritarian desires we see in American society today. And I think it also has something to do with the many fantasies of separation and civil war that are very much present in American society these days. The young Humphrey was born into a time as desperate as Americans have ever known, with challenges that seemed as impossible to surmount then as ours do today. And yet he believed in politics, in the power of mobilization, persuasion, coalition building, and occasionally compromise to make the world a better place for those alive and those not yet born. There's something to learn from his faith in politics, which is to say there's something to learn from his story. Uh, with all of that said, it is my great pleasure to present the Hillman Prize for Book Journalism to Samuel G. Friedman for Into the Bright Sunshine, Young Hubert Humphrey in the Fight for Civil Rights. Hubert Humphrey, as some people my age and older remember, suffered from the vice of talking too long. He, he was a senator and a vice president who lacked a governor when it came to one of his speeches. And his wife, Muriel, who was also one of his great political advisors, once said to him, Hubert, dear, a speech need not be eternal <laughs> to be immortal. And in that spirit, I'm minding the three-minute countdown up there on the monitor um, behind me. The first thing I want to say is how honored, profoundly honored I am to receive this award. You stole a little bit of my thunder with the slideshow before, but when I look at the authors who preceded me in winning this prize, it begins with John Hersey, an exemplar of both the narrative nonfiction tradition and the use of nonfiction in the pursuit of social justice. And it continues through people like Jane Jacobs and Kenneth Clark and Isabel Wilkerson and the writers I most appreciate in my own generation, like Nick Lemon and, and Clint Smith. So it is an enormous honor to receive this award. And I'll tell you also, in the night when we're talking about the power of untrammeled big business, it's a vindication too. My book was turned down by every corporate owned publisher in this city. And the reason it was turned down 
wasn't because of any particular aesthetic decision or historical argument about Humphrey. It was because publishers rely on a database called BookScan. And they can punch in how many copies did Sam Friedman's last book sell? How many copies did the last book about Hubert Humphrey sell? How many copies did a book about the Civil Rights Act of 64 sell? And decisions made. It's hard to express how humiliating that was to go through at this point in my writing life. I was at a point where I was seriously considering publishing this book myself because there was no way I was not going to let it come out. And so to have it lifted up by these judges and in Sidney Hillman's name means an enormous amount. What I also want to say is that this summer when the Democratic Convention returns to Chicago, there'll be so many parallels to Hubert Humphrey's worst moments, supporting the Vietnam War, having the nomination delivered to him by Mayor Daley's political machine at the same time when they were beating down on protesters and journalists, and giving a tone-deaf speech about the politics of joy at a time of division and polarization and political trauma. But the Humphrey I've written about, as Jamel so wonderfully put it, was someone who not only fought for civil rights and human rights, but writ large fought the same battle we're fighting now. It's the battle of inclusive, lowercase d, democracy against autocracy. His enemies were the same enemies that are abroad in the land now, using the same names, white supremacy, Christian nationalism, America first. And it was a fight that almost cost Hubert Humphrey his life. He was nearly assassinated for pushing for civil rights. And he got hate mail that sounds like it could have come from some of the people around today. Here's one example. When they start talking of racial equality, these are the words of his would-be assassin. When they start talking of racial equality, pull the safety catch on your gun. Hail to Minneapolis, capital of anti-Semitism. The United States was founded of, by, and for the people of European Caucasian descent only. If you oppose us and serve as the tool of Jewish communist interests, we promise you here and now that on the day of judgment, our day of victory, you will meet your just retribution. Funny, that word retribution, right? Well, Hubert Humphrey dodged the assassin's bullet, went on to do what he did, and there are a few lessons, and I'll succinctly sum up this way. He was a great coalition builder. His coalition started with a black journalist and newspaper publisher, one of the biggest influences in Humphrey's life, named Cecil Newman, and a Jewish lawyer who's like a one-man intelligence gathering um, operation on the anti-Semites and neo-Nazis named Sam Shiner. And it went on to include the magisterial A. Philip Randolph and other allies. Humphrey was someone who understood you need the inside game and the outside game. You need mass mobilization, and you also need people who know how to pull the levers on the inside. One without the other will not get the job done. And Hubert Humphrey understood at the end of the day that while compromise is often necessary and sometimes very well advised, that and you have to make partners with people who you never thought would be your partners, in his case, some big city bosses who helped push civil rights forward in the 1940s. At the end of the day, if you don't have a nearly religious belief, a moral vision in what you stand for, then nothing else matters. Thank you. Thank you.